Well, once again, good evening and welcome, everyone. I'm Susan L., Vice President, Executive Director of the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital. I'm so pleased to welcome you. It's really a pleasure to welcome you to our very first Leading Edge Medicine program in, of the decade of 2020. So we're really excited that you could be with us this evening for Ethics Through the Looking Glass. An intriguing title, wouldn't you say? This evening's, yes, it was. this evening's presentation will explore the concepts of patients' rights, surgeons' rights, the nature of consent, and the complexities that physicians and patients navigate every day while providing care. As we begin our program, I would like to thank you very much for your support of the foundation. Your philanthropic gifts given so faithfully over the years continue to drive our mission of enriching lives, saving lives, and transforming health care. Together, we are advancing breakthroughs in medicine, preparing a new generation for rewarding careers in healthcare, and making a difference in the care of our patients and families that we are so privileged to serve. Healthier lives, healthier communities, we are so grateful that you are on this journey with us. Now, many of our foundation's board members and team members are with us tonight. We are wearing the uh, silver badges that you see, so if you haven't yet had a chance to say hello, please do and introduce yourself. I also want to introduce the chairman of our board, the foundation board, Dick Miles, who's right here. He'll be coming up and saying a few remarks later, so um, for now, I'll just carry on, Dick. So. Um, uh, one of our board members, the foundation board members, is Dr. Ira Codner. Anybody know who Ira Codner is? <laughs> In addition to serving on the foundation board, Ira is Emeritus Professor of Surgery at Washington University School of Medicine. He is the founder of the section of colon and rectal surgery and the first section chief. He retired in 2013 as the Solon and Betty Gershman Endowed Chair in Colon and Rectal Surgery and remains one of the very strongest advocates for the impact philanthropy can have on medicine that I have ever met. Among his many, many accomplishments and of particular note, given our topic this evening, is the creation of a unique curriculum in surgical ethics, which he started at Washington University School of Medicine many years ago and which continues to get national recognition. Ira's expertise and compassion are well known and have been recognized by many. He is the consummate caregiver and teacher. It is his extraordinary commitment to teaching that has informed how many his students, his fellow faculty, as well as friends and fellow St. Louisans think about ethics. He has been a guide to many and his influence is sure to impact many generations to come. In 2018, just about 14 months ago, Ira was awarded the Foundation's President's Achievement Award. I think many of you might have been there and I remember when you spoke, Ira, it was as if I was sitting in a classroom. You gave us lessons and examples, and it was, it was um, very inspiring. And at that ceremonious event, he and his wife, Barb, were honored by a group of their friends who made gifts to establish the Barbara and Ira J. Codner MD Endowed Fund in Surgical Ethics. This is still new fund continues to grow. Its purpose is to provide direct and ongoing support for the work of Dr. Paroshka Kapar, which she will speak about this evening. Ira will share more in his introduction of our speaker, but it goes without saying, Dr. Kopar is a trailblazer in her own right. She brings national and international recognition to Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine as a respected leader among medical, student, uh, medical ethicists. Tonight, as we peer through the looking glass, we will examine the vital role that ethics education plays in the delivery of care, we are so proud to have both Dr. Codner and Dr. Kopar as part of the Foundation family and with us this evening to lead our conversation. And now, to get us started and to introduce our featured speaker, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ira Codner. And, and also note, we, we are recording this evening, um, and so, uh, just be aware, just want you to know we're recording this evening, so you can see this later. Uh-oh. Old folks need notes. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all for being here on this incredible, nasty, rainy, cold evening. Um, you're going to miss part of the State of the Union. 
it's, my, it's my pleasure to speak to you and to introduce Dr. Piroshka Kopar. Uh, our topic of surgical and medical ethics education is very important and personal to me and to my longtime partner, my wife, Barb. But throughout my career at Jewish Hospital, Barnes Jewish Hospital, and Washington University, I've had another fantastic supporting partner, the Barnes Jewish Foundation. Think about the honor bestowed on me to have been the recipient of support from the foundation throughout my career, starting in 1975, to now being on the foundation board and able to nurture other clinicians and researchers only to be rewarded myself with the 2018 President's Award. Before I introduce Piroshka, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you how we got to this point and to emphasize all of the community support that made it possible. It's a story I have to tell you. In about 1980, when I was still in private practice at Park Crest Surgical with my mentor, Dr. Stan London, I made the mistake of complaining to the educational powers at Washington University that we were recruiting as medical students the brightest young scientists possible, but we weren't teaching them how to deal with sick folks and their families. I was thus given the opportunity to create an elective for first year medical students entitled Dealing with Sick Folks and Their Families. <laughs> we created our own syllabus with such challenges as racial diversity, delivering bad news, incorporating religious principles, and navigating the increasingly complex medical system. I had the honor of teaching that course for 20 years. In 1985, Dr. Robert Fry and I were recruited from private practice to join the full-time faculty at Washington University. And I was awarded the endowed Solon and Betty Gershman Chair in Colon and Rectal Surgery, again within the BJH Foundation. You must understand that the granting of such a chair made possible all of the subsequent accomplishments in the area of ethics education, as well as an ongoing joyous relationship with the Gershman family. In about 2002, we created the Washington University Center for the Study of Ethics and Human Values. This was unique for the country in that it encompassed all schools of the university. The accomplishments were incredible, including a joint venture with the business school to demonstrate the advantages of creating the seriously needed program at the hospital in palliative care. This was only made possible because of the support from Deans uh, Greenbaum and Gupta, both of whom are here tonight. It's, it's my honor uh, to have you both here. You have made so much possible. This initially complex challenge uh, has evolved into our current Washington University Division of Palliative and Supportive Care, including our jewels of Evelyn's House and Dr. Patrick White occupying the Stokes Chair. After an initially bumpy start, these programs only survived because of the generous support of Ellen and Jack Deutsch and Dorothy Moog via the foundation. In 1903, 2003, not that bad, <laughs> I was offered and took a fellowship in clinical medical ethics at the University of Chicago. This led to creation of Washington University surgical ethics pizza rounds with the support of Dr. Tim Everline and my partnership with my colleagues, Drs. Mary Klingensmith and Douglas Brown. I know Doug is here tonight. Uh, he, he deserves a lot of credit for making this all possible. This led to a fourth year medical student elective, which has resulted in the publication of about 30 manuscripts in peer reviewed journals with the medical student as the lead author. That's a big deal. In 2008, I was recruited to teach a Washington University undergraduate fo freshman focus course on the Danforth campus entitled, of course, Ethical Challenges in Dealing with Sick Folks. I've even been gratified to learn that some of these freshman undergrad students pursued a career uh, incorporating their interests in ethics. We at Washington University fulfilled a leadership position 
and the National Surgical Organizations, the American College of Surgeons and the American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgeons, and became partners with Mr. Park Hamangar, a grateful patient from San Francisco. Parr faced death from cancer and became suicidal as a result of unethical treatment by his initial physician. He was cured of his cancer uh, by a colleague in colon and rectal surgery, and Parr committed to making possible ethical and compassionate care education for as many trainees, not only in the United States, but even Canada, was most of North America. This took the form of a series of $5,000 grants to institutions and surgical trainees. These programs all came through the administrative support of Washington University Department of Surgery, again with Drs. Eberlein, Kling, and Smith, and Brown. This group also made possible three national meetings here at Washington University where the course was set nationally for ethics education in surgery. Our own Yvette and John Dubensky and Carol and Mark Vittert generously helped to make these programs possible. One of the clear shining stars in these uh, programs and these grants became evident. She was an early Kamengar awardee, clearly the best in ethics education, creativity, and leadership. Dr. Poroshka Kopar earned her undergraduate degree in the Great Books program of St. John's in Annapolis. She completed her general surgery training at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and stayed at Dartmouth for a one-year cardiac surgery fellowship in preparation for her intended career in trauma and acute care surgery. She completed that training at Yale New Haven Hospital, and during her research years, she completed extensive ethics programs at Harvard University. So my dream became to have an ethics education program at Washington University within the Department of Surgery, led by Poroshka, and with all of my ethics-related activities supported by the BJH Foundation. And here we are, beginning the second year of the Barbara and Ira Codner Endowed Fund for Surgery Ethics Education, with Poroshka as the director of the Center for Humanism and Ethics in the Surgical Specialties, and already supported by generous donations from Peggy and Andy Newman, Yvette and John Dubensky, Carol and Mark Vittert, and amazingly, Park Hamangar. So, it's my great honor to introduce you to Poroshka Kopar, who will lead us on Ethics Through the Looking Glass. Welcome, Poroshka, and again, thank you all for coming out. Does this move forward or? Um, will my slides come up? Do you guys know? Oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Piroshka Kopar, and I am just touched um, by being invited here as your speaker tonight. Um, please forgive me if I'm a little bit nervous and jittery just because it's such a huge honor. Um, I really hope that my talk will spark conversation amongst all of us. Really the reason um, to do ethics is to have a conversation in a transparent form. And that's part of the looking glass idea is that it's a mirror and we look at it and we talk about what we see. Uh, I am, I've been incredibly helped by a number of people and obviously Ira being the foremost of them. And of course Dr. Eberlein, our chair of surgery has been very um, instrumental in support. I feel like with all this great help comes all this great responsibility, as they say. Um, so hopefully I will um, do it some justice. What I'd like to do tonight is tell you a little bit of a story about how I came to ethics and why it's interesting to me and how I think it should be interesting to you. So um, to start with a, a fairly personal story, um, I'm originally from Hungary and uh, moved to the United States when I was 17 years old. I went to St. John's College, like Ira said, and as part of the grade books program, we had to learn ancient Greek. Because how else are you going to read the texts of Plato if not in the original, obviously. Um, so on my very first week, we had a ancient Greek quiz. 
our professor came into the room, uh, gave us the quizzes, and said, hey, after the class, just leave them over there. See ya. And left. I looked around the room, started organizing the cheating mission. How are we going to do this with an open book? Let's, let's do teamwork, right? Let's not be selfish. Everybody looked at me like, what is wrong with you? Why would you cheat on a test? This, this is our integrity, knowledge, honesty. Where did you come from? Well, let me tell you where I came from. I came from Hungary. Um, this is Budapest. It's our parliament. And actually, the street that I grew up on is just next to it. Um, the high school that I went to is right across, right where that um, sculpture is on top of the hill. There's the royal castle, and we actually used to do PE in the royal castle, which is very nice. Um, but Hungary, as beautiful as it can be, and as historic as it can be, it also comes with a lot of history from the other side. It's always been on the losing side of everything. It was on the losing side of the First World War. It was on the losing side and ideology of the Second World War, not only hurting other people, but also our own country people. And after the Second World War, the Russians took over the country, essentially. So when I was growing up, it was not uncommon to be stopped in the street by a Russian tank and sort of just you know, all of your plans were on hold until until they sort of made sure that you were okay to proceed. As the Soviet empire sort of took over, being a pioneer was a, a thing that you just had to do in school. I was a pioneer just like those people, and we did communist exercises and learned Russian, and um, that's my very own pioneer um, document. So it was a early on ideology that we were um, based in, I guess. And then the Berlin Wall came down, and that was in 89. Uh, I was 13 years old at the time. I remember we were in class, uh, we were building something, and it was all put on hold so that everybody could listen on the radio about what was just happening. East and West were coming together, colliding, reuniting. Uh, the powers were going to be redivided and re-examined. At that point, we had hope originally in our country, but a lot of it turned to corruption. So my family moved to the United States in 94 as a result of that um, frustration. In the United States, things were very different. While in Hungary, I grew up with this idea, and this is back to that story, that you were always part of a virtue was to resist the system because the system was going to hurt you. The system was going to give you war and Russian tanks and it is not your friend. So if you can cheat, you're beating the system. Our teachers taught us how to cheat. Uh, a lot of times I already learned all the, all the information and they're like, no, 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 but you need to put it on this cheat sheet. <laughs> um, and it was just a very different ideology because really what they were teaching us is persistence, perseverance, and standing up for something else. But it came across as this really backwards thing. Whereas in the United States, I learned quickly that it was sort of just understood that you don't do that sort of thing. And so that made me really think about, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have these different priorities, right and wrong, uh, when you come from a different context. Is there true right and wrong? And I've struggled with that ever since, I'll tell you honestly. So it really felt like an experience of sort of going to the other side of the world to me, kind of through the looking glass. And um, I, am, I grew up with the Alice books, the Wonderland and Looking Glass before they were popular in the movies. Um, and you may or may not recall that the uh, looking glass story is actually a chess game. She goes through the mirror and there's a chess game that is played uh, through which her understanding of the world evolves. So that really resonated with me. And uh, it really started, it started to spark this, is, this question in my head, well, how do we know what's right or wrong? What is it that, that we actually know independent of what we are taught or our context is there absolute? How does that work? And this is really how um, we got to 
from my perspective, um, to our Center for Humanism and Ethics and Surgical Specialties Spelling Chess, because it really makes me feel like it is part of this game where, it, where you can't win everything, you can, uh, but you can win the whole game, and not alone, it's with a team, um, and it's very strategically, and it's sometimes unclear what white and black are in that game. So let me just give you a few, okay, that's wonderful that you know I have that personal experience, that's interesting, great. But how does that relate to medicine? How does that relate to surgery? I'm just gonna give you a few examples on how uh, there are certain things that we really just accept in surgical um, world, and, and maybe they're a little bit more tricky than that. Here is our very first, first do no harm. We kind of all think of that as the very first tenet of, of medicine, really, not just surgery, and, and as sort of the Hippocratic Oath in a nut. Well, if you actually look at the first Hippocratic Oath, it says, don't have sex with your patients. <laughs> it says nothing about this, it's just, <laughs> don't do that. Um, and then there's an addendum. It says, if they're a slave, still don't do it. Um, so we sort of rewrote that over history to don't hurt the person that you're treating. For the overwhelming majority of history, we really focused on the beneficence of I'm the professional who understands this problem, let me help you. And that sort of uh, created this paternalistic attitude. But at the same time, I feel like we're now swinging to this a little bit more autonomous uh, and where a patient can require just about a request, just about anything, sometimes when really it's hurting them. So at any rate, we say that our first tenet is first do no harm. But as surgeons, the very first thing we do is we reach for a knife. How does that work? So I'm gonna cut into you, but I'm not gonna hurt you. Well, obviously I am, but it's for the ultimate good Right? Did we agree? Uh, but at what level? How much good? How much hurt and how much good? It's not quite straightforward. Well, I'll just, I know. I know what I'll do. I'll just get your consent. No big deal. I'll just tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm sorry. I'll just tell you what I'm gonna do and you know, you'll be informed of risks and benefits and it will be great. It will be a, an agreement. And so this is sort of how we envision the informed consent. Somebody who is very well informed is not really sickly, because if they were, then perhaps they're not quite free to make that choice because they feel like they just need, need help. Someone who's very well informed is complete freedom of choice and can really weigh the options and say, yep, do this or do that. And maybe that sort of works in the medical world, which is where we examine medical ethics most of the time. We can say to a patient, hey, take some aspirin. It's going to reduce your risk of heart attack. It's gonna reduce your risk of stroke. Um, it may lead to some bruising. Okay, I can understand that. But what about when you're doing invasive surgery? What about when you're doing cardiac bypass? What about when you're doing an esophagectomy in someone? How do you say to someone, Hey, so first, I'm gonna take a saw, open your chest, then I'm gonna drain all of your blood. Then you may or may not be alive, it's a little unclear. Um, then I'm gonna fix it, maybe, I hope it goes well. Then I'll put it back together, and then, that sounds good, right? Uh, just read the paper and sign. So it's a lot more tricky to look at a really invasive process and say, yes, I have informed consent. Um, I would propose uh, that based on research that's been done on this, which, uh, which says that actually when you study people who are um, consenting to these, uh, these surgeries, they actually are not consenting to the procedure. They're consenting to trust their surgeon. So I would propose that it would be, it would be more meaningful to uh, spend more time on that relationship and trust rather than this sort of piece of paper that, you know, if I explain to you how I'm going to do my different connections in a surgery where I take your pancreas out, that's not really gonna mean anything to you. Same thing with surrogate decision makers. Um, so when any of us, is, you know, if we're sick to the point where we can't make our own decisions, even temporarily, one of our family members 
It serves as the surrogate decision maker for us. They should speak for us as to what we would want. So you can imagine, we sort of conceptualize it as that's probably the son in the middle, that's the father. When he can't make his own decisions, uh, the son will clearly know what father wanted. However, a lot of our patients after surgery look like this. They're in the intensive care unit, and the questions we ask the surrogate decision makers, I would propose inappropriately, uh, are things like, hey, did you want us to wean the levofed and go up on the vasopressin, and then we were going to give some blood, what do you think? And that seems not actually the concept of what was intended to be. It seems uh, like that is not actually surrogate decision making or informed consent. And when you look at studies, it's interesting, um, they've looked at studies of comparing the surrogate decision maker with the candy striper at the hospital and they scored equally on how well they understood the patient's wishes. And that tends to be about 60% correct. Uh, whereas people who make advanced, because you know, one solution could be I'll just write it down for you. Well, I'll just write it in this advanced directive, I'll give it to you, great. However, 50% of the times people change their mind. So it's problematic. It's, it's not straightforward and we pretend it is. So really what I am most driven by and what I'm hoping Chess will do, is doing, is looking at these murky areas and not pretend that they fit into clear white and black categories. Not pretend that, that these tools that work for certain things work for everything that we do. Sometimes some of the most grave um, gray areas have to do with where is the line between life and death. For example, the question of brain death is a murky one. It is a legal definition of death if you qualify to be brain dead. However, you can be brain dead in one hospital and alive in another because the criteria vary. So here's another example of we really try to draw these lines instead of maybe being a little bit more honest about the gray zones and putting a little bit more value on communicating our goals and values uh, instead of the actual means of how we get there to the doctor, instead of dictating. Like when you take your car to a mechanic, you don't say, and I'd like to, you to use this you know, screw. You say, I want, you know, I'm willing to do this, uh, otherwise I want to trade it in. At any rate, all of this falls on our new incoming students, our new incoming residents. After medical school, they get a white coat and off they go and ask these questions from people and do these things. Not only that, we give them knives. And here you go. Go and learn how to take the pancreas out and learn how to take the esophagus out, drain the blood and all that. But what about all these other things? How do you communicate about them? So um, what we have already done and we're ongoingly working at WashU and Chess is resident and medical school education. And the main goals are the following. It's quite simple, really, is to teach the language so that everyone can actually communicate about these ethical issues. The second thing is to recognize if your perspective is different, what it's grounded on. You may or may not be familiar with this ancient story where these blind men are trying to figure out what they're touching. And to some it may seem like a wall, and to some it may feel like a spear, or maybe a pillar, and it, it's an elephant, right? But it's only because they're only seeing part of it. So we really want them to, de I do, to detach themselves from their um, sort of brought in um, ideas of ethics and look at the bigger picture of what is actually going on when you consider all perspectives. And then of course communicating. It's one thing to know it, it's actually really hard to communicate that. Actually, especially when uh, people are dying, it's very hard to have that conversation with families or the patient. So we now have um, our residents, our students have um, certain curricula, and we are very excited that we had our first fellow, our inaugural ethics fellow this year, um, and we actually have a, a second one for next year. So we are the first one to have a surgical ethics fellowship, which is exciting. Now, as for future directions. Once Alice goes through the mirror, she meets the chess queen. And the chess queen tells her to run with her. And they start running. 
And Alice is out of breath, and the queen says, no, you have to run faster. You have to keep up. The future is coming. You have to go. Um, and Alice says, I can't. You know, I'm out of breath. And plus, we haven't gotten anywhere. Look, all the trees are right here. We haven't changed our location, and we've been running. And the queen says, I don't know what kind of world you're coming from. Um, if you want to actually get somewhere, you have to run twice as fast. It's not, you have to run just to stay in place. So uh, in order to sort of keep up with the expectations and the challenges of the technology in our changing world, one thing is to sort of keep running after what we've already done and we try to sort of make it fit. However, I'm more of the mindset of Charles Darwin who said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. Our medical world is different now. People live longer, thank God. Um, we have technology to keep you just about, um, I mean, really, we can keep you almost alive is a, in quotation marks, which is unclear exactly what existence it is, but we can keep you circulating for a long time. Um, and the options of the medicines, the, the research, it is, I mean, Wash was a leader in that. At the same time, as the opportunities become more increasing, our resources have to be limited. There's only so much of the money that we can spend on health. So maybe our current way is not going to match up with our future way of dealing with those problems. What to do with those problems? Well, maybe the answer is not, this is clearly the right and this is clearly the wrong. One of my favorite things in Alice and Through the Looking Glass is after the chess game, what ends up happening is she goes through all the challenges She's a pawn. When she gets the last square, she becomes a queen. So it's really from her experiences that she has learned how to transform, not how to go faster, but how to transform. So what I propose as future directions for chess, um, and they're ambitious, but it is to, to be honest about where we are and what we're doing, our social contract is our professional contract with our population, our patients, with you. And instead of saying, oh, yeah, sure, we'll keep up with that, but we can't, I wish we could just re-examine the social contract. Very interestingly, the social contract is different in, across cultures. That makes sense. In the United States, one of the reasons I love being a US citizen and have voluntarily you know, come to be one is because of diversity. Diversity of race, religion, opinion. I really think that frees your world and opens your mind. But because of that same diversity that is so essential to who we are as a country, um, that same diversity also makes it sometimes difficult to have a direction. So the difference between ethics versus law um, can be the difference in that. What I mean by that is the law is, because we have all these diverse people, the law is our common sort of um, guidance. So what we must do is told to us. But nobody tells us what we should do. And we all have these aspirations about what we should do. We can do better than the minimum. We can have higher standards, loftier goals, especially here at WashU. Um, so ethics is really about what we can and should do, not just what we must. Turns out that the chess board is probably not black and white. Turns out it's probably made up of all of our diversities and all of our cultures and all of these grays of um, right and wrong. So what do we do with that information? Um, two goals that I have for chess. One direction is to foster that communication, that transparency, and an ongoing conversation with the community whom we serve and hope to facilitate that, not just at WashU, but in other Missouri hospitals, because we really end up sharing a lot of patients. Specifically, an example that um, we are working on right now is to, to help this organization, who is a wonderful organization, Gateway to Hope. So here is a perfect example. This is a new era ethics problem. Gateway to Hope is an organization who helps breast cancer patients. They used to provide uh, free care for them. Now the demand is so much that they can't do that. So what they do instead is guide 
uh, people, patients, through the system, how to access the insurance that they need, how to coordinate their care, their transport, all of the essential things for, the, uh, for people to actually receive the care that they need. Recently, they opened up their gates doors in North City, and uh, a lot of people are in need there. Uh, in fact, twice as many women. Because of that, uh, they are now finding that their resources actually have to be allocated in some way. They used to be able to never turn a patient away, imagine that. And so one solution is to say, and wouldn't that be wonderful, yeah, we'll give you more money and we can support you so you can really help everyone. And that, I think that would be great. In the meantime, the reality is that they have to sort of figure out who to help and who not to. So Chess is, um, is going to work with them to really, really look at their organizational ethics, their foundation on what is the most ethical way to proceed with this problem. And that is something I'm hoping we can offer to other organizations as well based on what we learn from them. With that, I want to close and again thank Ira um, for everything and thank you for having me here today. I will love to have some questions. So the question is uh, sort of the interface between ethics and sort of insurance mandates and then um, the care that needs to be delivered against maybe medical advice. Am I understanding that correctly? In my experience, that tends to go in the other direction where the medical team wants to deliver something but they don't get to because of insurance reasons. And um, uh, most of the I've been fortunate enough, I'll say it that way, to have worked with organizations where once the patient's there, we will provide the care and figure out the money later, but that's probably not a sustainable system in the long run. And that's exactly the sort of thing that I'm talking about, is let's address these things sort of transparently and openly instead of just playing catch up and then it's somewhere, um, it's, it, because you do end up paying for it somehow, but it's done in a, in a non-standardized, that's very important, in a non-transparent um, way. Just one more thing to that. I recently presented a, um, my research on exactly this sort of question called the surgeon as a double agent, where you are, A, on the one hand, you're supposed to provide the best care that you can for the patient. On the other hand, you have these resource allocation decisions to make. Um, and how, how do you do that? And how do people, so it was an empiric study, looking at what do actual surgeons do? And it's a huge conflict for people. I think we're just ignoring them right now. <laughs> yes. Um, so, obviously, a difficult question, <laughs> but uh, I think there is so sort of the extreme is that we have this many dollars, right, and therefore we have to make these extreme decisions. Uh, but that's not the actual reality of our world right now. The reality is closer to we have this many dollars, we can still help a lot of people, but we end up. Um, sort of miscommunicating or misusing uh, how we treat patients and actually we could use some of that money to do it right. I'll give you examples so that it's not as abstract. For example, um, and this is why I'm so interested in one of the things that I was talking about, the question of informed consent. Um, we sort of somehow think, and I think it's a very American way of viewing the world, which is okay, uh, but we somehow think that a customer is always right. But patients are not customers. Patients um, have values and goals and quality of life things that are important to them. 
but they don't know what it means to get a certain presser or a surgery or things like that. Obviously, you should not lie to any patient and you should not be um, misleading anyone. But we spend a lot of resources on just being afraid to be honest with our patients about actual options that they have based on their values. It's really important to emphasize that. We're not telling people, we're not, I'm not advocating for telling people, you know, stop. I'm t advocating for saying, tell me what's important to you and I can tell you if I can get you there. If I can, I will. But if I can't, I'm not gonna tell you that you might get there. And so we spend a lot of our resources in that middle ground. And why well, I can't tell you I can't get there because I feel bad. Um, and I don't think that's doing anyone any favors, including that patient. And a lot of our resources are in that category currently. So I think what we can do is at least min minimize that gap in the meantime. Yes, sir. How do physicians walk the line between telling patients what it's really going to be like to recover and knowing that they really need the surgery? And, uh, and I would say, not being a physician, the vast majority of the people I've run into over multiple surgeries mm -hmm. feel like there was never a discussion about what recovery mm -hmm. was really going to be like. Right. So the question is how do surgeons talk to patients about maybe you should have this procedure but not really talk about the recovery. The, the discussion is focuses on the actual procedure. Not really doing a good job of the recovery expectations. I agree with you. It's a problem. Um, I honestly think it's a human flaw. Uh, part of it because I think you know we train forever like I've trained for 11 years to be here after medical school So then you really kind of want to share right you want to be like I'm gonna do this to you And I'm gonna do this and I'm so good at this stitch and only I can do it And obviously that's not how what people say But I feel like people have this like surgeons have this drive of like really sharing the intricate things that they'll do Obviously the patient doesn't care about that um, the patient cares about what is recovery going to be like, when can I ride my bike again, or whatever it is that's important to you. So actually one of the studies that we are in the very, very um, initial phases of, and hopefully Dr. Eberlein's not going to shut it down right now, in the back is um, to look at the conversation, to see if we can randomize people into conversations where that's exactly what's talked about instead of the actual procedure, and say, hey, what, tell me what's important, tell me about you. Tell me what's important to you. Just talk to me about who you are. Talk to me about what your fears are. Talk to me about what you want to know about after the surgery. And see if patients actually have better satisfactions and outcomes based on those conversations instead of the, and I'm gonna go give you this drug and I'm gonna cut this and I'm gonna use this suture to sew that. Yes, ma'am. Totally agree. <laughs> and, it, and it's very hard because you, don't, you want to do what's right for the patient, but mm -hmm. there's all that family dynamics mm -hmm. that go on too. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the question is about family dynamics when really family members don't agree on how to help the patient, when the patient cannot speak for themselves. So that happens a ton, all the time, right, in the intensive care unit, really not just there, but that's where it's most common because the, the person themselves is unable to speak for themselves. So there is the, we have the tendency of running to the legal answer, but actually in Missouri, which I think a lot of people don't recognize, there is no hierarchy of who is your decision maker. It is actually who the medical team thinks best represents the patient can be taken as such. Having said that, different hospitals, including ours, have policies that say we would like two physicians to say this or this person or whatnot. At any rate, that doesn't answer your question. I'm just saying a lot of people have the inclination of running to the legal answer, which is not necessarily what's best ethically because that's the minimum, not what you can do most. So we actually teach the residents this. I just did a session on this whole thing. We did role play and everything. And it's so interesting how hard it is for, for residents and everyone really to say to the person you're talking to, 
hey, can, let's talk about your brother. You know, what would he want? I totally understand that you would really miss him, but just tell me about him. And so I, what, what often is helpful is to really, again, learn about the patient and just ask, tell me about the patient. And so people then start understanding that you care, that you care about the person, that you're not just trying to check a box. And then once you establish that relationship, it's much easier to reorient the conversation to, you know, as you were saying, he used to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And now he wants, you know, do you really want him to have a double amputation? You know? So using sort of their own stories of their loved one to get the values that seem like the patient would want can be helpful, but it does take a lot of time, a lot of patience, and a lot of continuity of that care team, uh, which is one of the biggest challenges in our modern medicine. Um, and I think practice. So I think it was, um, I practiced it with the residents in that um, session, and then they come with me, then they see it, then they practice it. it the practice of it is, is really key. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Um, can you, uh, you're a trauma surgeon. Correct. <laughs> Never. Yeah. Yes. What's an example of good ethical things to come up when you're practicing as a trauma surgeon right in the people? Oh my gosh. Uh, what are some of the examples that as a trauma surgeon I face uh, as ethical issues on a regular basis? Okay. Um, two immediately come to mind just from recently being on call. Um, one is the, this is sort of a, um, a common problem. At night, we, there's one trauma surgeon on call. Our hospital is very busy. St. Louis is very violent. Um, so when a patient is taken to the operating room uh, to, for, I don't know, six gunshot wounds, then I'm there operating. A second trauma patient comes in, so I have a backup person on call. But um, it is a little bit difficult sometimes to activate the backup person, not because they're not there, they will come in and everyone's helpful, it's not that. It's that you know that the backup person has a full day tomorrow and they have to have all these operations. So you don't want to use that unless you absolutely have to because you don't want to compromise their ability to function at the best for those patients. So what ends up happening a lot of the times is, um, Say I already did the, the most important part of the surgery for this patient, and I'm about to just close her abdomen and wake them up. But um, what becomes a practice sometimes is to say, well, let's just leave them open, take them to the ICU so I can attend to this other patient. So the care I'm delivering to one patient is influenced by the care that I'm expected to deliver to another patient. And it's not necessarily outside the standard of care. It's just not necessarily the best you could do for that patient. So that is a very common one. Another one is, when is it assault to treat a trauma patient? We just had one the other day. He uh, was shot through the upper legs, both of them. So as such, it's the sort of standard trauma, trauma practice to do a rectal exam. I hope I'm not making anybody uncomfortable, um, to make sure that there is nothing in their abdomen with those gunshot wounds. And uh, one, of, um, one of the people there uh, suggested that perhaps that was assault because um, maybe the patient doesn't need that. And the patient was upset already, having said that he was high on cocaine. Um, and so what, at what point do you accept the objection of the patient to be treated in that really quick scenario, and what point do you say, no, actually you don't have the ability to make this decision right now, let me make it for you. Those are some of them, okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am, yes, no worries. Okay, well thank you. Wow, those are some things that will make you talk and make you think. Uh, thank you, Dr. Codner and Dr. Kopar, uh, for your insightful presentation and comments on such a thought-provoking topic as this. 
ethics and surgery, and healthcare in general are at the forefront of every interaction the Barnes Jewish Hospital staff have with patients, their families, and the community every day. You've certainly offered us some things to ponder on, and uh, we really appreciate it, uh, Dr. Kopar, and your experience in, in uh, treating a vast array of people and caregivers down at Washington University. Um, we look forward to hearing more about you in the upcoming years and, and the work that you do at Washington University School of Medicine and at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Um, as Ira mentioned, um, the donors who created the Barbara and Ira J. Codner MD Endowed Fund in Surgical Ethics are, are very important to its existence. Particularly, we'd like to thank Peggy and Andy Newman, Yvette and John Dubinsky, and Carol and Mark Vittert who along with the Codners are providing what could be called an impactful start for the pioneering work that Dr. Kopar is leading. This is just one example of the impact philanthropy can have. Your gifts really do move the needle and save and change so many lives. So many of you are part of that momentum, whether it's your gifts to support the Codner Fund or Dr. Kopar's work or other research on, on the Medical Center campus or if you give to support the, the uh, development of future medical leaders and healthcare providers at the School of Medicine and the Goldfarb School of Nursing. Uh, all of this informs the delivery of patient care and both the quality of life in and the health of our community. Uh, I am uh, Dick Miles, I'm the board chair of the foundation and on, on uh, the part of the foundation, we'd like to thank you for coming tonight and for all your support. I'd like to ask you for one more thing. If you could go home and ponder what you've heard tonight and tell your friends and tell your neighbors and come back and see us again. Actually, view our website, the Foundation website and the Foundation Facebook page where we'll have uh, a, a movie of this uh, talk and every other talk that we have in what we're calling leading edge medical medicine events. We have four of these a year. We invite the public in, and we encourage you to invite your friends. Come back and see us. Uh, and I'd like you to, to circle uh, Feb, uh, May 12th, which is our next uh, event. I think it's going to be here. And we'll be having uh, Dr. Randy Bateman, who is at Washington University School of Medicine, uh, talk about his breakthroughs in Alzheimer's research. And having heard that before, I can tell you it is it is positive and exciting and hopeful in an area that I personally was wondering when is the change going to come. But there's so many exciting things happening in this medical community that I think it's going to be a great, uh, a great opportunity for you to learn and get current on what's, what's really happening. So special thanks to the foundation team for putting this event together and providing us with a wonderful program. Uh, we also want to thank the team here at View 17 for exceptional food and services. And um, thank you for coming tonight. It's not over. Uh, Doctors Kopar and Codner have agreed to stay around and answer any questions that you have. And uh, so, so uh, partake of all the goodies back there. And um, please come back and see us. Circle May the 12th on your calendar. You're all welcome. Tell your friends. And thanks for coming tonight.